Um, and I want to start by thanking the uh, Canadian Embassy here for organizing this and also the museum. I had a wonderful tour of the museum, which has some uh, wonderful uh, pieces from North America and, and uh, the North American Arctic, and some from British Columbia, which made me a little homesick. Um, I also want to thank you for coming uh, today and uh, for you for your introduction and making some of my talk easier. As uh, Alicia said, I actually have never been to the Nunavut part of the Canadian Arctic, so if you have questions on that, you, you should ask her and not me. And I apologize for not being able to speak uh, in, in Spanish today. Um, the uh, 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 head of the uh, um, Arctic Council uh, for the Sweden chair Swedish chairmanship uh, recently said, the Arctic is hot. And he wasn't actually talking about the temperature. He was talking about the incredibly uh, increased interest in the Arctic. And as many of you know, uh, the Swedish chairmanship of the Arctic Council is ending soon in the middle of May, and Canada will be taking over the chairmanship of the uh, Arctic Council for the next two years. And the uh, um, head will be uh, Leona Aglukak, who's uh, actually an Inuit woman, uh, our current Minister of Health. And so we're very excited about the uh, opportunity to once again uh, lead the Arctic Council. And I think this is a, a very exciting time in terms of uh, the Arctic as a whole, but especially in terms of, uh, what, uh, of Canada's involvement. And as you said, the Arctic is a big part of both the Canadian geography and the Canadian identity. Um, I also just wanted to say that um, when I talk about the Arctic today, I'm really talking about the Arctic and the sub-Arctic, the uh, circumpolar north, as it were. And um, as Alicia said, I, I'm more of an expert in the Siberian Arctic. I've been to a lot more of the Russian Arctic and sub-Arctic than I have been of, to the Canadian Arctic and sub-Arctic, which is maybe ironic. Um, uh, I thought I'd also just stick in a very short advertisement here. The organization that I'm president of is the International Arctic uh, Social Sciences Association, and it's open to anyone who wants to belong. I would love to see more Spanish members, and uh, it's, uh, so there's the website if you're interested. Uh, you, uh, it's, uh, like I said, it's, it's a member-driven organization. Uh, so I wanted to start with uh, exactly what Alicia was talking about, uh, which is the situation that uh, climate change is critical to the Arctic. And this uh, map here, I hope you can see it from the back, it shows the, uh, um, in a little orange line there, the extent of uh, Arctic ice in 1979, and then the extent of Arctic uh, ice this summer. And you can see there's been a vast uh, decrease in the extent of Arctic ice. Um, change in the Arctic uh, will, uh, climate change in the Arctic will have a, a serious impact on Arctic environments and on people's lives. And it presents a lot of challenges, some of which uh, Alicia mentioned, um, melting permafrost, uh, um, potential greenhouse gases escaping from the permafrost, flooding, changes in the distribution of, of animals and plants, and that means invasive species, and these are just some of the changes. It also presents opportunities for the growth in mining and uh, other resource extraction, for the growth in shipping, uh, growth in tourism, things like that. What I want to argue today is that sometimes in looking at climate change in the Arctic, we also tend to forget that there are other changes going on that are also very important. And so what I call this talk is, it's about climate change, but also much more. Some Arctic residents will tell you, if you ask them, that climate change is a concern, but they've been dealing with climate change for millennia, and they're adaptable. They know how to deal with this. Others will say that the pace of change is a problem, and they haven't ever dealt with that before. But many indigenous Arctic residents will say that the rapid social and economic changes that are happening are what's really threatening to them. So 
I don't want anyone in this room to leave thinking that I'm saying that climate change isn't important. Climate change is very important. But my message is that we have to remember about the changes that are happening today that will affect life of the Arctic residents today, tomorrow, next week in terms of economic, cultural, political, and social changes. And I also, am, as the president of the International Arctic Social Sciences Association, I want to stress that a lot of these questions need to be answered by social scientists. And it's increasingly important that we include social sciences uh, in the uh, um, looking at the Arctic and dealing with these, these problems. Some of the changes that I think are important are uh, um, under these different five categories demographic change, economic change, political change, cultural change, and health and well-being. And I want to say a few words about each of these. I also want to say that uh, this is a pretty short talk, and uh, so I'm going to have to make some gross generalizations. The Arctic is a very diverse region. There are many contrasts socially, culturally, economically. And so uh, I uh, um, apologize for a lot of simplification. And maybe during the question period, we can talk more about the diversity. So who are we talking about in the Arctic? There are about 4 million people who live in the Arctic. Now that it totally obviously depends on where you draw the boundary of the Arctic. So this is Arctic and a little bit of the sub-Arctic. Um, and we often think of indigenous peoples. And I've probably encouraged you to think about indigenous peoples by including this uh, picture of uh, some Avain woman in uh, northeast Siberia. Um, the d indigenous population itself is very diverse. We have uh, Inuit and uh, Chukchi and Nienets and Avain and Athabascans. And there are about, uh, um, well, there are well over a hundred different peoples who live in the Arctic from the indigenous population, many, many different languages. Um, but the indigenous population are only 8% of the Arctic population. And I think we sometimes forget that. The, the bulk of the Arctic population is not indigenous. Another thing we often forget is the uh, Arctic is highly urbanized. 80% of the Arctic residents in Russia live in cities. And some of these are pretty big cities. 60% of Icelanders who are part of the Arctic live in the capital city of Reykjavik. So again, highly urbanized. And then, as Alicia um, alluded to, the rural population is very spread out, very sparse, living in very small and widely distributed villages. So these cause different issues for the urban and the rural population. I guess that C went hanging there. Um, some of the demographic uh, changes that uh, affect the Arctic. Um, through much of the Arctic, we're seeing a population loss. And so from this map, what you see is the red areas and pink areas are areas that are losing population in the Arctic, and the areas of blue are the ones that are gaining them. Uh, the funny little dots in the Canadian part of the Arctic is are due to the way we collect statistics uh, uh, for settled points versus uh, um, districts or larger areas. Um, but this uh, shows you that there are a lot of uh, um, areas of loss of population. Birth rates among uh, um, Arctic residents are fairly low, uh, a little bit lower among the non-indigenous than the indigenous population, but relatively low. Um, mortality rates are higher on average uh, for the Arctic residents than non-Arctic parts of these uh, populations of these same countries. Um, but the main influence is out-migration. And what we see is sometimes referred to the hollowing out of the population, especially from rural areas. Young adults are migrating out and sometimes leaving uh, their children even behind. What we're losing are the most ambitious and most skilled people. Now, some of this is due to push factors, the decline of local resources, such as fish stocks, or the, the decline of services. In the Russian north, we had a crash in services during the late 1990s. But a lot of it has to do with pull factors. One has to leave the Arctic in many cases to re receive education or uh, jobs. 
I should say that this trend has reversed in a few areas in recent uh, times. There are more people going back to the uh, Norwegian north and the uh, Fenniscandian north, as you can see from a little bit of blue there. The red sort of predominates, but uh, um, in most parts we see a domination of pink and red. Um, urbanization, as I said, is increasing in the Arctic as elsewhere in the world. And again, this is a map which shows areas that are increasing in population in urban centers and other areas where uh, um, urban or villages are, are decreasing. Um, and so what we see is um, in most places the urban populations are increasing, only again in Russia there's some decrease in the urban population. Um, the pace is different, but the trend is the same across the Arctic. And this is a trend for both the indigenous and the non-indigenous uh, part of the population. 10% of uh, Canadian Inuit live in southern urban areas. There's a joke that the largest Sami community in uh, um, Finland lives in Helsinki, and the largest Sami community in uh, uh, Sweden lives in Stockholm. 7,000 Greenlanders live in Denmark, most of them in Copenhagen. The population of Greenland is 55,000 people, so 7,000 is a pretty large percentage of that. That's 13% of the total population. Um, urbanization, urbanization means uh, changes in lifestyle, increasingly uh, diversified economy, better services in education, better services in child care, more diverse cultural activities, more diverse social relations. Urbanization has a gender dimension. Women are leaving rural places at a much greater rate than men are. This is because men tend to stay more in the traditional economic sectors and women are leaving to pursue formal education and uh, the jobs that they can have from that formal education. And this has a negative effect on rural areas and the rural economy. It affects family uh, structure. It's very hard for reindeer herders in the northern part of Siberia to find wives these days. It affects public services. It affects the volunteer sector, as women tend to predominate in the volunteer sector. There are a few areas, like I mentioned, where this is changing, but it is, for the most part, a trend throughout the Nordic. Then we have another really interesting trend where groups are coming into the Arctic who previously weren't seen in the Arctic as global migration increases around the world. Immigrants from Thailand are coming into Fenniscandia as berry pickers. They're coming into Alaska as fish processors. Immigrants from Eastern Europe are coming into some of the mining, country, uh, mining areas of uh, the Arctic. Um, it's predicted that uh, industrial resource development in Greenland may attract up to 2,500 Chinese in the very near future. And again, 2,500 seems like a fairly small number until you think of a population of 55,000. 5% 5 of the Greenland population could uh, be a Chinese resident soon. Okay, a little bit on the Arctic economy. I think we can split the Arctic economy into three, three different sectors. You've got the international resource economy, oil, gas, minerals, uh, fisheries, forestry, and these areas are indicated on the map, some of the main uh, uh, centers. I think we sometimes forget about the role that the transfer economy plays. This is the money that the capitals send north, Ottawa and Washington, D.C., and Moscow, and uh, uh, Helsinki and Trump's uh, uh, Oslo, are sending north to support the north. And that is a big part of the northern economy. And then finally, the traditional economy of lo local resource extraction, fishing, reindeer husbandry, hunting, uh, those kinds of things. And these uh, activities occupy the same space, but they often aren't very well connected. They are connected a little. A woman working in an office in the transfer economy has a little bit more money perhaps to invest in a snowmobile or an ammunition to spend her weekends out on the land hunting. Uh, so these things are to give her husband the money to uh, spend out on the land. Uh, these uh, um, activities are also highly sensitive to outside forces. So there's a lot of boom and bust, especially in the uh, international resource economy. 
and also in the transfer economy. And it has a lot to do with political interventions can change things quite quickly. I wanted to mention a few other changes that are happening in the Arctic economy that we often don't think about. And these are commoditization and privatization and uh, concentration, geographical concentration. So in terms of commoditization, we see in the Arctic the replacement of services that were formerly provided by the residents for themselves, and now they're being commoditized. Child care used to be pro provided by your grandmas and your aunties. Now you end up sending your kids to a, a creche or a, a nursery school. Um, Health care services. You used to have medical experts uh, from among the native population. Now uh, we use uh, um, professional doctors. Leisure activities become more and more commoditized. Privatization, including in fishing and mining, housing services, retail services. They used to be mainly cooperative. And this is true for both North America and the Soviet North. Even reindeer herding is now being privatized in Fenoscandia and the Russian North. We see the development of small businesses. And I think it's interesting to look at Canada in the development of, of businesses, especially among the indigenous population. The Inuit and the uh, First Nations in northern Canada have been more successful than the non-indigenous population in creating small businesses in some areas partly due to treaty settlement and the capital or the money that they've received that they can then invest in airlines and, and uh, stores and things like that. In terms of resource extraction, which is going to play an increasing role in the Arctic, much is uh, concentrated or increasingly concentrated geographically in terms of company towns. These company towns often don't really help the local economy Workers come in and fly back out, and there's very little interaction with the local uh, people. We're also increasingly seeing local people raising the issues about ownership to the region's natural resources. Who should own them? Who should have access to them? Who should be able to exclude others from them? Under what terms? And who should benefit from resource extraction how should the benefits uh, be shared between the local population and the distant shareholders of companies? And how should they be uh, managed so that generations down the line, two, three, four generations, can also benefit from the extraction of resources that are happening today? And these are big and difficult questions. Some of the external drivers that I think we have to keep in mind are uh, the uh, global rise in raw materials prices, and especially because of the demand um, from uh, uh, places like China and India and other Asian countries. And also increasing accessibility makes these resources, which were formerly not uh, economically viable, to now be uh, economically um, interesting. Uh, so I want to introduce the term double exposure. What I've been talking about are globalization forces, changes around the world that are also impacting the Arctic. But then let's bring climate change back into the mix. Uh, accessibility is uh, going to be uh, um, one of the features of climate change as the Arctic becomes more accessible for shipping uh, and uh, as uh, new sources of fish move into the Arctic, and as uh, you can get to the uh, minerals more easily now. So all these issues have both a sort of a globalization side and a climate change side, and together we can talk about double exposure. Let me just give you one example in terms of fishing. Um, opportunities are created, but they're not created equally. As climate warms, we'll see new fish stocks go into the area, some with great commercial value. And we'll see the, sh the benefits shifting from one group to another. Different fish operate under different licensing structures. So new groups will probably access the licenses to the new fish stocks. Capitalization is different. Fishing for cod requires different uh, capital than fishing for, say, tuna. 
and uh, different types of boats, different types of technology, all that kind of stuff. So when new fish stocks move north, different capital, different uh, technologies, different companies will have uh, better access to those. So an overall increase in fisheries in the Arctic may mask differential gains and losses in community terms. We can also anticipate that uh, industrial fish stocks, due to the interactions of uh, overfishing and, and uh, climate change, adverse climate change, um, there, that there will be uh, crashes in the industrial fish stock. And these are going to uh, really affect settlements that depend on fishing. Oh, I'll, I'll just uh, give another quick example of that. Tourism, I think, is another interesting one where they'll see it, we'll see an increase in cruise liners and in land tourism. And tourism can often uh, really transform rural areas. Small communities can uh, experience great disturbances but also opportunities. But if you think about tourism, it requires a lot of capital to develop, especially in terms of cruise tourism. Bigger ports, more hotels... Some of this will be unaffordable to some uh, communities. And so, again, there will be gains by some communities and losses by others. In terms of key political changes, I think we have to uh, consider what's happening around the world as a whole and how this affects the Arctic. Gorbachev gave his uh, famous Murmansk speech talking about the opening up of the Arctic in 1987, and we've seen a great reduction since then of military tensions in the Arctic and a great increase in operation. The Arctic Council was established in 1996. It doesn't deal with security issue. It only has an advisory capacity. But in the last year or so, it started dealing with much more sensitive issues and strong multilateral agreements on emergency response. And uh, it's working on shipping agreements now. And so these are sensitive issues, and uh, it's gaining traction in these areas. At the same time, we've seen other parts of the world plagued by instability. The northern sea route is partly attractive in that it will reduce the distance from uh, the east, uh, Seoul, Korea, Japan, China, to uh, Europe. And I think it's the uh, uh, Seoul to Rotterdam uh, decreases 40%. But as importantly, it will help us avoid uh, pirate-infested areas such as the Malacca Straits and the the problems of the uh, politically uh, volatile Suez Canal. And so uh, these are issues that uh, are are important to consider. The other thing uh, I want to say is that uh, in terms of political changes, the Arctic itself has been a place where some really interesting new governance regimes or structures are being developed. The Arctic Council is one, a group of eight countries getting together and deciding to work together on many issues, like I said, in an advisory capacity, but still with quite a bit of power. In the Arctic, new co-management structures have been developed, new impact benefit agreement structures have been developed, and I think these are things that we need to export to the rest of the world. I want to talk a little bit about some key cultural changes. Increasing accessibility to the Arctic well before major climate change and uh, well before increased connection to the rest of the world has been happening and has cre- uh, created vast cultural change. This has been happening for centuries, but it's accelerated since World War II. And some of the ways that this has really uh, been encouraged is through mandatory schooling and throughout most of the Arctic, through urbanization, and through uh, the introduction of wage labor and incorporation of people into that. And these are all things that were imported from uh, outside the area. And then, of course, immigration of uh, uh, a lot of people into the Arctic, that 92% of the Arctic population that's non-indigenous. But more recently, I think we have some really interesting changes happening. One is low-cost communication technology, mobile phones and Internet. And they're increasingly available. And they allow Arctic residents to connect with each other and talking to each other. This has reduced the difference between urban and rural life. It's really helped political movements in the Arctic. The Sami parliament, the the Sami council, the Sami getting together, the Inuit getting together across four different countries, and the Sami, again, across four different countries to politically organize. 
We've seen the communications uh, improvements helping uh, education through distance learning. It's not quite so necessary to leave the Arctic now to receive a post-secondary education. We've seen wonderful advances in telemedicine and providing uh, medical services. However, there's also challenges to connectedness. First of all, most of the information produced on the internet, or almost all of it, is not from the Arctic. So uh, it's coming up north and it leads to the erosion of local languages and to some degree local cultures. It also is a source of new societal norms, including the consumerist culture that is being communicated through the mass media. The global, and let's be uh, realistic, the highly American-driven entertainment culture exposes Arctic residents to a limited selection of lifestyles. In the late 1990s, in the early 1990s too, I worked in some very small communities in Siberia. And at 10 o'clock in the morning, the uh, secretary to the mayor, who I might be interviewing, came in and turned the TV on. And she watched a B-rate Mexican soap opera called Los Ricos Tambien Lloran. Or sometimes it was the C-rate American Santa Barbara. And then they would ask me questions about life in North America, assuming that what they saw on Los, Tambien, Los Ricos Tambien Lloran was the way that all North Americans lived. I think it's the 0.1% of North Americans live that way. I guess they also thought we were very dysfunctional. But the laughable point here is that the norms and values promoted by media often challenge and devaluate local beliefs and local cultural identities. And I think they also nurture aspirations that fail to be in line with local education and local development opportunities. And this leads to cultural stress. However, I think we also have to remember that, and I'll say a few more things about cultural stress in a minute, that while cultural stress is affecting part of the population in some very serious ways, there's a lot of really interesting cultural adaptation and cultural fusion going on. I'm using here a rather trivial example. These are the, uh, um, uh, for the most part, covers of different CD uh, um, albums. Um, communication technologies have really pushed cultural gains in areas. Arctic people, like I said, are connecting more with each other. And we're seeing the flourishing of Arctic cultural industries, such as the media, um, using YouTube, Arctic music and film industries. Here we have uh, Canadian Inuit Tanya Tagak. Have any of you heard of uh, heard Tanya Tagak play? It's a wonderful in, uh, fusion of throat singing and electronic music. I really suggest you go on YouTube and Google her, and it's wonderful. Um, Nuke uh, Posse uh, of uh, it's called Nuke's Posse, and it's Greenlandic rap and Greenlandic hip hop. Marie Boyne Peterson is a, a Yoik inspired uh, singer from uh, northern Norway. And so these are just some examples of the uh, performing arts, the visual arts, the, uh, um, the music, uh, literature. I was recently in a Greenlandic shop in Copenhagen where there was a beautiful new cookbook, sort of a Janie, Jamie Oliver type of cookbook, but it was Greenlandic recipes in Greenlandic and Danish for some very high cuisine. The Arctic is also at the forefront of educational initiatives, especially in terms of distance education and uh, bilingual education. And I think we can't forget to celebrate the creativity and the accommodation of change that we see in Arctic, where new cultural forms are being produced that enrich both the Arctic and beyond. Sometimes we forget to tell the success stories of the Arctic. Okay, finally, I want to say a few words on the health and well-being in the Arctic. Health service in the Arctic have vastly improved over the last century. The availability of advanced medical services, either in place or by telemedicine, have grown dramatically. Stable food supplies reach most areas and have eliminated starvation. And Arctic residents uh, have a much wider variety of food goods and other goods, though at very high costs, as you probably uh, saw 
in the areas. Life expectancy has dramatically improved in the last half century. Unfortunately, Russia is an an exception to this, where the life expectancy of the Arctic male is less than uh, um, the uh, um, retirement age, and the life expectancy of the indigenous male in the Arctic is only 35 years. Throughout the Arctic, however, we see the increase of uh, tuberculosis, we see the rise of uh, HIV and AIDS, and we see the rise of other contagious diseases. We also see the rise of obesity and diabetes and other cardiovascular diseases due to changes in uh, diet and lifestyle. Diet is compromised by the high cost of imported goods, so there's a lot of junk food that's being eaten, but also the fact that local country foods are being polluted by PCBs and DDT and other pollutants. And worse, we witness a devastating increase in the rates of domestic violence, child abuse, homicide, and suicide. In Nunavut, the rate of uh, domestic violence against women is four times that of the Canadian average. In the Russian North, like I said, the uh, average life expectancy for a native male is 35 years due to high rates of homicide and suicide and accidental rates, uh, accidental deaths um, related to alcohol consumption. And Greenland tops the world in uh, uh, several years recently in suicide rate. So, and that's in terms of per capita. So these figures speak to a population, or at least part of the population, troubled by mental health issues, which may be attributed at least in part to rapid change, both cultural and economic, sort of acculturative stress. Um, The rapid economic changes and social changes then are exacerbated by climate change. As I said at the beginning, I think some Arctic residents consider these rapid economic and social changes even more uh, problematic, more challenging than climate change, and I think you can see why from some of the statistics I've given you. But I do want to return to uh, the issues of climate change for a few minutes now. Climate change is a physical process, but it obviously has social roots and social consequences. In fact, the ones we really care about most are the social ones. The changing cryosphere conditions, the changes in the sea ice cause changes in accessibility, which, as I mentioned, have both global implications for resource exploitation and local implications for subsistence hunting and reindeer herding and other local important activities. The changing biogeographic conditions, changing distribution of uh, flora and fauna will influence Arctic residents' access to resources. This is a picture taken in Alaska of a community that has disappeared. It has has had to be totally relocated because of climate change and the uh, erosion of the edge of the uh, uh, land. And uh, Arctic residents are dealing with this in a number of places. So such changes in terms of moving whole whole towns, whole villages, will stimulate further cultural change and further political change. I hope you can see the uh, words there, yeah. Um, So what I want to say is that uh, there's a lot of work that we have to do. We have to be able to prepare for these changes and to be able to figure out how to adapt to them because some of them are going to happen. We would like to modify climate change, but we're already too late for some of the changes, and uh, so we're going to need to be responding to some of them. And to do that, we have to understand uh, a lot more of the social issues. We need to understand how individual and collective responses to environmental changes happen, and to political changes uh, as well. We have to understand values and beliefs that different uh, groups have about uh, climate change. We have a whole group of people still denying climate change out there. Well, how, how can that be? What are uh, the values and beliefs that inform that? But also uh, different responses to climate change, different approaches to climate change. What are the values and beliefs behind that? We have to know a little bit more about how different groups are capable of adapting How does this differ across space? How does it differ across different ethnic groups? How does it differ by gender and age? 
And so all these are social science issues that have received uh, relatively little attention. Now, I think it's worth mentioning some of the achievements. Uh, we just finished celebrating the uh, International Polar Year, which was 2007-2008, but sort of dripped on into 2012. The uh, um, previous International Polar Years, a uh, century ago and a half a century ago, had absolutely no social sciences in them. There was also an International Geophysical uh, Union year in 57, um, which had no social sciences. In the most recent International Polar Year, 20% of the projects had to do with social sciences. So I think this is very encouraging. And I think that uh, there are places where we have made major improvements. Some of these are integrating traditional knowledge into understandings of how change, both climate and other change, will affect the Arctic. And I would say that I think uh, we've done this well across the circumpolar north, but I'm especially proud of what Canada has contributed to this. I think we've better uh, um, identified local vulnerabilities to change and potential uh, um, adaptation strategies. We're doing much better than we were doing a few years ago in terms of working with communities. Communities are demanding that we work with them, and I think a lot of scientists have risen to that occasion and are learning how to work effectively and appropriately with uh, local communities. And related to that is a recognition of the importance of indigenous knowledge and the ways of uh, indigenous ex experience and, and ways of knowing that are very different than Western ways. It's hard to wrap one's head around this, but it's very, very important. And indigenous peoples, like I said, are demanding on, uh, this. And we're also uh, certainly understanding more about what the past has been like and past ways of adapting past actions and what these uh, can uh, tell us about uh, future adaptations. But I'd say there are a few places where we really need to pay a little bit more attention. Um, this is certainly true of some of the Canadian social sciences, but I think it's true from ac across the circumpolar north. Um, first of all, a lot of our real gains have been in understanding local and traditional knowledge and local and traditional systems. Anthropologists and cultural geographers, at least, really like to get out and work with uh, indigenous people. There's a joke that says the average Sami family up in Norway or Finland includes a mother, a father, two children, a reindeer, and an anthropologist. The anthropologists like going to visit the Sami or the Inuit or the Chukchi. 92% of the population is non-indigenous and we're not studying that population. These include fourth or fifth generation families who've uh, been in the north for a long time, sometimes seven generations up in the R Russian north. It includes folks who went up after or since World War II because of high wages. Uh, they didn't plan to stay, but they were lured to the north. They fell in love with the north, and they now consider it home. And it includes immigrants from different parts of the world that have previously uh, uh, been much present in the North, who are now uh, contributing increased numbers and who are uh, um, uh, providing new sources of, of uh, migrants with uh, different cultural values, with uh, um, different, uh, um, different uh, things to offer the North. The best restaurant in Nook, the capital of Greenland, is the Thai restaurant. And uh, I'd recommend any of you getting to Nook to try it. Um, we need anthropologists, economists, geographers, political scientists, social uh, sociologists to spend time understanding the motives and the aspirations and decisions of these groups. We also tend to go into the North and ask people about the local situation. And I would say we're a little bit of uh, guilty of parochialism. So a favorite thing of uh, anthropologists is to go and ask the uh, Inuit about snow and ice, and seals, and polar bears. And the Inuit know an awful lot about snow and ice and seals and polar bears. But the Inuit have an op opinions about urbanization and industrial development and shipping 
and in-migration and out-migration and the loss of women from their communities. And these are all very important issues that I think we need to spend more time on. And so uh, that would be a, a challenge. And I think we need to not only spend more time, but our national governments need to consider these as important uh, um, topics to uh, fund for, for research. So finally, I just want to say a few things about uh, um, what social science is contributing and can contribute. It. Um, change, as I hope you've gathered from the talk, is complex. There are multiple factors. There are synergistic factors. And uh, we, there's a lot of, of uh, stuff to understand, and we need to uh, really uh, be working on that. We're doing a much better job, and I think there's a lot more to do. Um, we can do this through multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary work. And I think uh, the Arctic has been a very fruitful place to uh, um, start that work in the last, uh, I'd say, 20 years. We're measuring, we're, we're developing ways to measure and track human development in the Arctic. And this is really important. We have to know what is happening up there. Um, I've been involved in a, a project called the Arctic Social Indicators Project. And essentially, it's taking the United Nations Human Development Index type of indicators and adapting them to the Arctic and adding new ones in for the Arctic. The Arctic Human Development Report Number 1, which was published in 2004 uh, and is available online, said that there are three things that are important to Arctic residents. Contact with nature, the uh, um, cultural viability, and the ability to control one's own destiny. These are things that are specifically important that Arctic residents talk about again and again. So in measuring our human development, we need to measure the material well-being, we need to measure the health, we need to measure the uh, educational level, that kind of well-being, but we also have to measure fake control, control over one's destiny, cultural well-being, and, um, and this closeness to nature. And we've just developed a set of indicators for that, which we hope to use to, to track uh, development in the north. Um, the Arctic Human Development Report itself, we're working on uh, report number two, which will come out in 2014. And I think the other thing is that we can continue to work on improving the co-production of knowledge with Arctic residents, indigenous and non-indigenous local residents, across a whole range of topics. We need to continue to build partnerships with natural scientists. I, uh, I don't know if, uh, if Francisco, you're still here. Uh, we're, we're working together on some of this quite uh, well through different organizations. Uh, Francisco Navarro and I are both on a, a couple of uh, on the International Arctic uh, Science Committee, which has different groups, and and um, so I think this is a, a way of uh, um, encouraging integration into. Uh, um, uh, of research on natural and social sides on, on adaptation and resilience. And then I think another important thing is to make sure that the science we're producing, whether it's social science or natural science, is accessible to decision makers, to policy bodies, and to Arctic residents. So I wanted to bring two uh, resources to your attention, and one is this Arctic Human Development Report. And uh, like I said, it's available uh, from downloading on the web. If you Google it, you can get the whole thing or any chapters. There's another very interesting book with the title of Megatrends. doesn't sound like anything necessarily having to do with Arctic, but it is about Arctic change, and it's just recently come out. And um, uh, as I said, the Arctic Human Development Report will be coming out in 2014. I'm a co-lead on this project, and if any of you are interested in this and would be interested in reviewing chapters before it comes out, I would love to know about it. Um, and uh, so I think that concludes my comments. Um, I'd like to say again thank you to the Canadian International Centre for the Arctic, which has arranged these, uh, these talks to the uh, uh, Canadian embassies, and uh, the, the maps were from that uh, Megatrends book. Thank you very much, and I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Professor Fondal, for such an interesting talk. Um, ahora um, tenemos tiempo para algunas preguntas. Puede ser en inglés o en español porque pueden traducir.
¿Quién quiere preguntar algo? El primero he visto ahí al fondo. Usted es el segundo. El sí, sí, usted. Sí. Antes de contestar, me piden que se presenten. Preséntese, aunque sea al final, por favor. Well, in terms of increased migration uh, into the Russian north, as many of you probably know, there was a huge outflux in the 1990s, uh, starting in about 1991, and uh, a very large uh, um, part of the uh, uh, population left the north, the non-indigenous population uh, flowing out of uh, the Russian north. There were two different reasons for this. Uh, right as the Soviet Union broke up, a number of uh, um, peoples from the former Soviet republics left. So Ukrainians went back home to Ukraine, or Belarusians went back to Belarus. And some of that reversed, so that by 1994 or 1995, at least some of the Ukrainians and Belarusians and Moldovans started to come back to the north. Um, but there was also uh, a big outflow because of the termination of services to the north. So that whereas during the Soviet period, a lot of northern communities had been subsidized and very well supported with uh, food stuffs and medical um, supplies and teachers and doctors and all that, that uh, was not um, the case in the late, in the mid to late 1990s. And when those services were lost, people who could afford to leave often did so. Um, there, of course, is a concern about not having enough people in the north in Russia. Uh, some uh, North Americans have written that there's still too many people in Russia. There's a book out, The Siberian Curse. Um, but uh, there is an interest, and I think there's an interest probably in... in um, I mean, obviously, this isn't an issue that's spread across the north, but some of the industrial centers need more people for resource development. And um, so uh, there's uh, policies being developed both at the federal level, but also often at the, um, uh, I don't really want to say regional level, not local level, but regional level to attract workers into the, uh, the oil fields and the uh, uh, mining uh, sector and all that. And it's an interesting uh, situation of the tension. Russia has um, also increasingly seems to be interested in shift workers for some of the resource development and using that model of the two weeks in, two weeks out, or whatever the period is, so that it's not building up some of the sources. So there is a tension there between different camps, if you want. Um, I, I don't think I can give anything more specific than that. I, I'm not good at uh, reading these uh, governmental documents and then remembering all the details. <laughs> Um, in terms of China's role, that's an also, also a very interesting question and a politically loaded one. Um, the Arctic Council uh, is comprised of the eight countries that border the Arctic and then um, permanent participants, which are the indigenous groups. So the Inuit Circumpolar Council, the Gwich'in International Council, the Aleut International Association, the Sami, um, are all represented at the table. And then there are observers, and there are, is uh, increasingly an interest in more and more countries to become, to have that observer status. And there's also an increasing interest in the observers to have greater power. Now, the observers include countries like China, 
and uh, South Korea and um, Japan and there's a whole set of countries that already have that status and a number of countries who are trying to gain that status now. The Arctic Council is just re or changing, uh, redeveloping its uh, criteria for observer status. And uh, at the May meeting, the ministerial meeting, a new criteria will be voted on. So we don't really know exactly what that's going to look like right now. Um, China has been very assertive in the last uh, couple of years and probably especially in the last uh, several months about its uh, having rights to the resources of the North. And it certainly is putting a lot of capital into the development of icebreakers and um, technologies. It's asserting its presence in the North. And even with the International Arctic Science Committee, uh, which uh, Francisco and I are on, and also, uh, where's Daniel, is he still here? Um, yes, he's on also. Uh, the Chinese are now uh, sending delegates and making sure they're there uh, to those meetings. And uh, often uh, each country has an opportunity to send one or two delegates, and I think the Chinese are more increasingly sending two delegates to some of the meetings. So there is a, a, a political will and uh, the backing behind it to, to be seen as a major Arctic player. Thank you for the question. Um, wow, that's a, that's a big one to answer. And I have to agree that there's a lot of negative trends that are going on. Um, and I, I don't know if we can talk about Canada because we have uh, the government of Canada and we have the government of the Northwest Territories and the government of Nunavut and the government of uh, Yukon and then we have you know local uh, governments and all that. Um, the uh, in chairing the Arctic 
Council, uh, Canada has put forward three areas of focus and uh, one of them is uh, um, sustainable northern communities. And um, I think uh, that um, what's becoming evident is uh, the, um, the future chair of the Arctic Council, uh, Leona Glukkak, she um, has made it very clear that she feels that the humans are the really critical part of the uh, Arctic. But, again, that's an advisory body. That isn't the Canadian government, and she has to convince us, um, uh, our Prime Minister, of that. Uh, I, uh, there, there are some very negative trends, like you say, as in terms of resource extraction not really being done for the future, uh, or for the um, uh, local residents and their futures. Uh, I do think there are two things I'd say. There are some very interesting developments, small scale, and they certainly don't balance out some of the larger scale, but in green energy in the Arctic, in the development of uh, new technologies in the Arctic that will really help the population. The other thing I think it's necessary to, to uh, say is I haven't worked with the Inuit in the Arctic. I work quite closely with a, a um, Athabascan group, uh, Klazda Nation, and um, you know, any of Klazda Nation will admit that they want their pickup trucks and they want their big screen TV and, and that they don't want to be stuck in something, you know, a hundred years old hunting around for moose in the forest. They certainly want to be able to continue to hunt the moose, which means that they want to be able to be out there hunting the moose and they want the moose there to be there for hunting or the same thing with caribou. So they want to... Uh, take care of the environment so that the uh, animals don't disappear, but they also want to be able to go out with their truck and hunt the moose with rifle, not, uh, not spears. And, and so there is that tension too, and how do you balance those? And, and uh, not only greedy white people from, the, uh, you can say greedy white men, I, I sort of like the man, <laughs> blame it on you guys, no. But greedy white people from the south, um, uh, you know, want, uh, these resources, but uh, to some extent the Arctic residents certainly want those resources too to make their lives uh, um, you know, more easy and, and uh, livable. Um, central heating and, and uh, electricity and all that. So I think the real challenge is figure out how to do that sustainably. How to do that in ways that use uh, renewable energy, renewable resources. I think the 21st century, the big challenge is going to be uh, energy and moving away from the extraction of uh, um, non-renewable energies into uh, energy resources, we, we're going to have to do it. Now, whether that's not going to be the second half of the 21st century or not, I don't know, but uh, I, that's, that's my own belief. Um, I'm quite interested in this question from a totally different point of view. Uh, I, um, as I say, I teach at the University of Northern British Columbia, and the university recently went to uh, bioenergy and has reduced its greenhouse gases 85% uh, in doing that. When it's colder than minus 20, we have to burn a little natural gas to back up the uh, bioenergy, but uh, it can be done in the north. And um, obviously in the Arctic, you can't be using bioenergy, but there's wind and solar and, and uh, turbine and uh, mini hydro. And so I think those, that's one, one real key issue that we're going to have to change.
the, the gentleman at, at the back has raised the uh, obvious uh, things, the, one of the issues that are of concern, that there, there are issues of concern in the, in the, the future of, of the Arctic. The Canadian perspective, I am, I should have introduced myself, I'm Isabel Sava from the Canadian Embassy. We have my little group, especially the men has organized this event with you. Um, and indeed, you've mentioned that the Minister, or Minister of Health, who's also Minister for the Arctic Council, she's presently traveling in, in Northern Europe, in fact, uh, from the beginning of this week until next week, to visit um, other, other countries, Norway, Sweden, Finland, uh, for the preparation of the, our presidency. And indeed, you've mentioned one of the three teams, uh, and I think probably the, the government or people that have heard people like you, because uh, it seems that one of the priorities, you mentioned one of them was sustainable collectivities in the north, but the two other priorities that the Canadian government have for their presidency is the responsible exploitation of the Arctic resources. And of course, in terms of navigation, the safe navigation in the Arctic. So I'm sorry it was not specifically a question, but on this, perhaps you would explain if you collaborate with the Arctic Council or what is your relationship with them? Sure, yeah, that's a. I'm, I'm glad you brought up the other two themes because I forgot to uh, mention all three. But um, uh, IASA, the organization of which I'm president, has observer status. And uh, so I um, attend uh, the Arctic Council meetings and I can attend the five working groups. Um, time and finances don't necessarily allow that, so I tend to go to the sustainable development working group meetings. Um, and. Uh, I try to send other counselors of our organization to the other meetings if they happen to be. There's going to be a, a PAME. I'm forgetting what that stands for now, but there's one of the other working groups uh, is going to be meeting in Rovaniemi, and we happen to have a counselor in Rovaniemi, so we'll, he'll, he'll go to that. But um, I think it is incredibly important to uh, try to track what the Arctic Council is doing, and I found the people there very receptive uh, to the... Um, input of both the permanent participants, um, obviously as their key members, but of, of the other organizations. Um, I just lost what else I was going to say about that, but uh, yeah, so, so anyway, I'm, I'm headed up to Tromso next week for the uh, Sustainable Development Working Group uh, meeting, and um, it's a... It's a Good, good group to be part of. Oh, I know. I, I was going to say that the uh, Sustainable Development Working Group is actually currently setting up a social, economic, and cultural specialty group um, because they realize that as a group of bureaucrats sitting around the table, they don't necessarily uh, have all the answers, and so they're developing a uh, sort of a go-to group for this. So, yeah. But there are constraints because those are just the Arctic countries, and so you don't necessarily get the views of, of uh, uh, Spain or France or, you know, as well represented. Yeah. ¿Alguna pregunta más? Por favor. Gracias por la palabra. Yes, and I, I couldn't give you the figures off the top of my head. Um, the uh, indigenous population in Canada is the fastest growing population in Canada, and the uh, birth rate among Inuit and among uh, First Nations is, is uh, quite a bit higher than the birth rate among non-indigenous population in uh, um, Canada, and the same is true in Alaska. I don't think the same is true for the Sami, and in um, uh, Russia, the birth rate among the indigenous population is higher than among the non-indigenous population, but it's not as high as for North America. Uh, so there, there are fewer kids being born to indigenous uh, folks in, in Siberia. Now again, that's across 40 different indigenous peoples, and there's variation among the different indigenous peoples too. But. Uh, 
And the death rate is higher among all the indigenous peoples than the non-indigenous peoples. I think the Sami of uh, the three uh, Fennoscandian countries, the gap is very, very small now. Um, the gap is a whole generation in Russia, uh, about 35 years, uh, well, 35, 45, 50, yeah, about 25 years difference. And the gap is, uh, I think it's less than 10 years, but not a whole bunch less than 10 years in the North American North. I may be outdated a little, but I think it's about eight to ten, eight years or so. So there's a, a gap, so about a half, you know, a third of a generation in, in uh, North America and a full generation in Russia and almost nothing in Fennoscandia now. And so, but uh, if anyone else knows these figures better than I do, I, you can correct me. I, I, uh, I, I teach a course on circumpolar geography, but I haven't taught it for five years now, so my information may be a little out of date. Alguna pregunta más? Bueno, hago yo una. Uh, There's one question. Um, are there um, how many indigenous scientists? I mean, in social science or in science, are involved in those in this research about them? Uh, are there, uh, or they are, they are the indigenous, or they are, they are the other people going there to research about them? Are there really scientists coming from this population? Yeah, there's an increasing number of indigenous scientists with uh, university degrees. Um, unfortunately, a lot of uh, indigenous people don't even finish high school still, and that is a problem, but we are getting an increasingly number of, of you know, university graduates and, and uh, um, masters and PhDs uh, that are leading the research. Uh, but I think the other way they're becoming involved is as community researchers. And uh, not necessarily with the carrying a degree, but having a different type of expertise and having that expertise recognized. And so um, I had a project for five years, uh, well, it was actually the better part of 10 years, but the last five years was with a um, First Nation group that was uh, totally co-managed where uh, the university had five professors and the First Nation had five uh, um, com community experts and we worked together on, on uh, all aspects of designing the research questions, designing the, uh, the methodologies, uh, both the graduate students and the uh, First Nations uh, youth went out and did the interviewing and did the analysis together. And that's becoming more common. So I think there's two answers. First of all, uh, a small but steady growth in indigenous scholars in the more traditional way that we understand that, but also an increased uh, recognition that there's a lot of expertise that we uh, um, need to recognize in the communities. Sin más preguntas, muchas gracias por su charla, gracias a ustedes por su interés y por sus preguntas. Y hasta la próxima. And I'd like to thank you again for coming. It was really a pleasure to talk with you.